Okay, I think everything is fine, I hope. <laughs> thanks a lot, Katrin, and thanks a lot for being here. And uh, I really have to say I'm really excited to be here. And I've been excited like since uh, the first time I heard about the final FEWS conference. And it's cool that we are already, that we are finally here. And I have to say that this feels really like family. And uh, so thank you very much. And uh, so now it's time to go back to science. I don't want to cry. Uh, <laughs> okay. So um, so again, yeah, I'm, I'm Iris, and I work in the in Prague in the Czech Academy of Sciences with the Vitek, Ladzel, and Susanna Musbergova. And today uh, there. There's been a small change of program, as you might see from the slides, because we're going to talk about the natural gene body methylation variation in wild strawberry populations. Okay, so as you might know already, DNA methylation uh, is the covalent addition of a methyl group on the cytosine base. And in plants, it can occur in three sequence contexts, which are CG, CHG, and CHH, where H is every base except for G. So we also know that uh, since DNA methylation um, induces a comp compaction of the chromatin, it usually, it's usually a repressive mark. However, um, it can have also a, a different eff effect on gene expression, for example, when it's found um, on gene uh, bodies. And this is what we are going to talk about today. And indeed, gene bodies can be, um, uh, methylated genes, sorry, can be divided into unmethylated, when they have basically no uh, DNA methylation across the gene bodies, and these are usually associated with active gene expression. And then we have uh, this second class of the T-like methylated genes, which present high methylation in all the sequence contexts, uh, and these are usually repressed. And then we have the, the third class, this one of the gene body methylated genes, uh, which present only CG methylation across the gene bodies. And this class, um, I have to say that um, is being, um, has raised quite a lot of interest in the scientific community because it has this uh, weird thing that, yeah, it has uh, methylation on the gene bodies, but still these genes are associated with active expression. But also, uh, these are, um, usually constitutively expressed genes, and this kind of methylation is evolutionary constrained. So orthologs, uh, so uh, orthologs um, across spe among species, they present similar, let's say, methylation patterns. But at the same time, um, if you, in Arabidopsis italiana, if you remove, experimentally remove DNA methylation, gene expression will not be affected that much. So, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, so what has been proposed is that uh, this kind of methylation might have some um, role in the evolution and adaptation uh, of, uh, of species to the environment. But this is uh, still, again, the function is really not clear. We don't know if it has a function or no idea. But and today we, I am trying to give, yeah, to present some very recent um, data analysis we, we did to try to provide some insights into this direction and then maybe open a discussion or something. Uh, okay, so what we are asking today is whether in um, uh, wild pop, in uh, the wild strawberry, we actually have different gene body methylation patterns and how these as are associated to gene expression. And also then I would like to do a um, comparison across a few plant species. Then the second question is whether these patterns actually vary across natural populations and whether these are inherited across clonal generations. And the last question I'm asking today is whether uh, these uh, gene body methylation patterns can be actually associated with some cl uh, climatic variables of origin of these populations. Um, so again, what we are using for this study is the wild strawberry because it's a great model. And so it has a wide natural distribution. It is deployed with a small genome and a good reference genome also, and also good annotation uh, files and so on. And it presents both a clonal growth and a sexual reproduction. But what we are mostly interested in in this study is the clonal reproduction of, of the wild strawberry. Uh, so what we did, 
few years ago, is collecting 21 natural populations of the Welsh strawberry um, across a latitudinal gradient from three European countries, which are Italy, Czechia, and Norway. So basically ranging from the southern to the northern upper natural distribution of this species in Europe. From each country, we also sample the plants following an altitudinal gradient, so from the uh, lowlands to the mountains. And what we did is um, collecting leaf samples of these plants from their <coughs> natural environment, and this is what we are calling here field samples. But also we collected the same exact plants and we transplanted them in our common garden, which is housed in, uh, in the Czech Republic in Prague. Uh, and we let the plants clonally propagate for one year. So what, we did, what did we do with all these samples? We um, checked the uh, epigenetic status of the plants, both from field and garden samples with um, whole genome bisulfite sequencing. But also from the uh, garden samples, uh, we sampled, uh, we checked, the, we performed RNA sequencing in order to check the gene expression uh, status of these plants. Okay, so what I'd like to point out here is that since we are working with natural populations, we do have genetic differences between populations. But when it comes to comparing field with garden uh, conditions, we're working basically in the abs absence of genetic variance because, as I said already, the garden samples are clones of the field samples. Okay, so um, in order to answer the first question, we performed a K-means clustering analysis, uh, which is uh, trying to associate the genes to different clusters according to their methylation level in each context and also according to their gene expression. And we selected four um, different clusters, which is this one of the, so we have on the left, the uh, cl cluster of the unmethylated genes. As we can see, they have very low methylation in all the contexts and they have some uh, expression. And this actually account for almost half of the total genes in Fragare Vesca. And then we have the, this um, uh, second uh, plot, which is showing the T-like methylated genes. As we can see, high methylation in all the context and uh, low, let's say, ex gene expression. Uh, and then let's, I selected two of these, um, I found two clusters associated with the gene body methylated uh, class. So one, the third, this one, is... Um, associated with um, higher expression. And then we have the last one, which is uh, uh, associated with the lower expression. Okay, so here I'd like to do a small comparison across species. So basically in Arabidopsis saliana, from, um, so Zhang et al, uh, 2020, they uh, proposed, and there is uh, this uh, uh, picture here, they proposed that basically the uh, gene body methylation uh, patterns uh, are present in different, let's say, epigenetic states uh, within uh, uh, a plant. And this, uh, there is some kind of homeostasis in which basically the, this uh, uh, level, methylation level can somehow um, be um, changed from one state to another one. And of course, this uh, kind of variation is, can happen also within uh, species, but of course the idea is that it's a bit higher across species. And uh, here I'd like to actually do this um, comparison across uh, this Arabidopsis taliana uh, data set, but also this uh, Populus nigra, which is the uh, uh, Lombardy poplar. And this is a data set from, unpublished from the Epidivers network actually. Um, and so basically here we can see the percentage of genes that has, have been assigned to each, to each of these uh, cluster. And we can see that they actually vary quite a lot across species. So if we look at the unmethylated cl uh, cluster, we have a very high percentage of these genes found in Arabidopsis taliana, and then they are low and lower in Fragarevesca. And then the other way around, we have the T-like methylated, we have very few of these found in taliana and many more in Fragarevesca, and same for gene body methylated uh, genes, which again is suggesting that we have some uh, um, 
across species variation, uh, which is, uh, I guess, uh, interesting to point out. Okay, so it's time to go to the second question. Uh, in order to answer this question, we perform this uh, principal component analysis uh, clustering of DNA methylation distribution for each of these four clusters of methylated genes separately. And this is what, this is what I show, I'm showing here is for the CG context and in the field condition. And uh, as we can see, we have uh, a nice clustering for all these uh, four clusters of genes going on according to the country of origin of the plants, which is suggesting that we do have some uh, um, variation of gene body methylation across um, natural uh, populations of Regalevesca. But now, to, in order to answer the second part of the question, which is whether these patterns are inherited across clonal generation, I will show you what happens in the garden. A little bit of suspense, okay. <laughs> okay, it's basically the same. So, uh, in the garden we have the same exact clustering for all these class, uh, class, classes of genes. Um, which, is suggested that, which is suggesting that actually it seems that this kind of methylation is being inhabited across clonal generation. And now I'm showing the same thing for CHG. And again, it's very similar, nice clustering, dividing the plants per country of origin, and also um, very similar um, plots between field and garden. And the same goes for CHH. Here, the only difference I'd like to point out is the principal components in the um, garden, which are basically explaining much less variance with respect to the field, which is suggesting that uh, in this sequence context, C CHH, probably some of this uh, methylation is being um, reset through across, uh, uh, through a, sorry, across uh, clonal generations or affected by the environment. Okay, so almost the end. Uh, so uh, here we are, uh, are going to answer the, the last question, which is whether these kind of patterns are associated with the climate of origin of the plants. Uh, so the X in these tables are basically indicating the uh, statistically non-significant correlations between, we have uh, here, we have the, some climatic variables of origin of the plants, and then here we have uh, uh, the different uh, methylation or also gene expression of uh, these different clusters of genes. So what we can see here is basically that we found a positive correlation only for um, gene body methylation. So only for the CG um, methylation um, found across gene bodies, which, they, which are uh, associated with latitude longitude and precipitation of origin of the plants. And also here we have, uh, actually we have a correlation between the gene expression of this uh, low gene, gene expressed genes with uh, the precipitation temperature of origin of the plants. Okay, so it's time to wrap up. Again, we found in, in the wild strawberry, we found these uh, four clusters of gene body methylated genes, let's say, which um, we can say they are present also in other species, but what is changing is the percentage of genes being assigned to each of these cluster. And then we found that uh, many of these methylation patterns are actually different across uh, natural populations, and they seem actually to be inhabited across clonal generations. And also when you change the environment, so from field to garden. And then finally we also found that only CG gene body methylation is associated with some um, climatic variables of origin of the plant, uh, which is suggesting that this kind of methylation might have an adaptive role. We don't know. Okay, so at this point, I really would like to thank my great supervisors, Vitek and Susanna, who are doing uh, a great job. And again, I really want to uh, thank the whole Epidagers, which has been amazing. I have no words to describe that. And in particular, also, these guys, Barbara, Dario, uh, Steffi, Adam, Nila, and Paloma, whom I'm working more closely with. And thank you very much for your attention. 
And yeah, I'd be very happy to get your questions or some comments or whatever, or just approach me. I usually don't bite, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Um, are there questions from the audience? Yeah, um, on the last row. Yeah. M maybe take the microphone. So you said you propagated the plants for one year under the control conditions in the greenhouse. How many generations is this actually? And do you have an idea how long environment-induced epigenetic marks are inherited to the next generations during the clonal growth? Yes. Uh, yeah, this is a good point. Thanks for asking. Uh, so in the, in the garden, we basically, uh, I would say like, that the clonal that we let the plants clonally propagate for a couple of generations. It's not, uh, yeah, completely, let's say, sure for every plant because Fragaria creates this uh, very, you know, complicated nest of plants. But usually, it should be like a couple of generations. And for the stability of these marks, uh, that's a uh, that's a great point. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, we don't know. There, are some, there is some evidence in other, in other um, species saying that they can be stable up to, I don't know, eight generations or something across, like, sexual, uh, across uh, clonal generations or something. But, uh, yeah, so here we, we don't know and we haven't tested, tested it. Maybe there is a talk in uh, the last day, actually, speaking about that. And then, sorry, I don't remember the thing about the environmental uh, vari variation or... Okay, perfect then. <laughs> At the end we eat on purpose, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, and then there was another question. Um, hey, it is. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was, I really like your camera clustering, and I was wondering uh, how you did it. How you decided only four clusters, or if there were like more variation? Like I don't know. I was wondering how you did the clustering. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Adri, for the question. Um, yeah, so basically I, I ran it for several, several clusters and um, several number of clusters. And the, the four clusters, I, I chose them because they, uh, they were the only ones uh, giving me, let's say, some kind of um, information uh, which made some sense. <laughs> you know, like the others, for example, they had uh, very similar patterns, for example. I don't know, the tea like methylated, they, they were very similar, just very, um, I don't know, they were just a bit shifted on the methylation scale. But this one, I think, are the, like, uh, the four clusters are like the, the best, at least to, to me. Because they, they give, let's say, different kind of, uh, yeah, information. One There's question from uh, Twitter. Christina Richards is suggesting that you have tried a linear model in addition to the PCR to find any other pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thanks, Christina, for your question. Uh, so the answer is that we haven't, actually. We haven't, but uh, <laughs> that's a good thing to, to check. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a great one. I, I thought that your patterns were not so obvious, mm -hmm. so maybe there's some difference there that you just haven't found yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, so with this, we have to move on. Please save your questions for later. Maybe you can post thanks. them already so we have them stored in the...